Good morning. It is the middle of March 1941. Welcome aboard the U-Boat 48. Today, we'll aim to replicate one of the most daring raids of all time in World War II using the U-Boat attacks, the Scapa Flow attack. And although we're March 1941, this attack really took place around 18 months ago in October 1939, just a few weeks into the war. A U-Boat designate the U-47 crept into the UK's Royal Navy base, the largest Royal Navy base, wedged between some Scottish islands off the northern coast. We'll take a look, which form almost like a natural sort of harbour port area, mostly protected by the islands, which, if you like, act as massive walls, with just three narrow entrance areas. There were 51 ships inside this Navy base at the time, Preen, the moved in on the 14th of October 1939 and at least 18 of these boats were described as quote unquote fighting ships. The U-47 commanded by Preen went for the largest target he could find, the battleship the HMS Royal Oak. The first torpedo struck at 12.58 a.m. and most of the crew that heard it believed that the dull explosion was perhaps some sort of explosion internally, perhaps in the paint room, and so they didn't respond to it. Nobody for a moment considered that a U-boat had snuck inside the Royal Navy's largest base. However, 20 minutes later, gave Preen and his U-47 all the time he needed to reload and fire another salvo off and that would seal the fate of the HMS Royal Oak. Preen managed to escape, and with it, the most daring raid against the Royal Navy, probably ever, was complete. We're going to see if we can replicate that today aboard our trusty U-48. Just one number aside from the U-47 that was the actual boat done to use this raid. And as La Rochelle fades into the distance on the 14th of March 1941, I'll bring you back when I've got something to report. And on this one, we really want to hang on to all our torpedoes, if at all possible, so we can cause max carnage once we get there. I'll bring you back with a little update once we're a little further away. The crew are all well, half rested, half asleep. We'll see you soon. Good morning. It's shortly before sunrise on the 4th of March 1941. We're making good progress. I'm going to take this opportunity to show you what the map looks like. And so here we are. Uh, we left a port of La Rochelle yesterday afternoon. We've uh, come across a large swathe of the Bay of Biscay. By the way, so many U-boats were sank in this area, especially from the middle of the war onwards. is unreal. I'll show you that at some point. So the U-48 under our control. I'm thinking here's where we want to be. And so really we've got three options. We come around the west of Ireland. Uh, we come through between the island and the UK. Or we try and go uh, the, the English Channel. Um, I think it's probably going to be our best bet to actually come around the English Channel. Because if we go through this way, I mean, there's no question about it. Um, Destroyers galore. If we come through this way, although there's more open room, I just think we're going to run into a lot of uh, both ships and convoys randomly. It's, a, you know, the all the shipping lanes between the UK and the US connect that way. Um, sure, there's going to be the occasional patrol boat down the English Channel, but bearing in mind, everything that will effectively be on our south side is going to be friendly territory um, all the way around. So we've got uh, multiple options, including... The Port of Rotterdam, I've never been to this one. Um, I'm not sure if it's active yet. There used to always be something in the original um, version of this game. We'll have to see, yeah. So English Channel up here. And then to show you uh, what we're talking about, how these uh, islands form a natural harbour. Uh, so here we see the three entrance areas I was talking about. Uh, we've got some icons uh, representative of like U-boat nets. And um, we see it there, the U-boat nets to the east. We've got some mines to the south and some mines to the west and everything else island. And so this area here, and if we take a look, it's actually quite big. Uh, so if I stretch some tape, 
there we see 18 kilometers from east to west so that is already mm, 10 11 miles and if we measure it north to south well it's 12 kilometers there we're about 13 kilometers there and again um about 23 kilometers there so we've got a huge area and this is why the royal naval used and the royal navy used it as their main place of keeping hold of ships Nowadays, I doubt the Royal Navy could even scrape 51 ships together in total if it tried. Just two hours later, the captain, that would be us, have planned the route. I'll show you what we've come up with. And so the attack here is uh, going to unfold in the following manner. Up through the channel, round like this, up here, across here. And then this little green dot signifies uh, basically where our mission is going to begin. Um, the total distance for the route we see there, 2,104 kilometers. That's from our current position. Add on the distance between the Bay of, uh, uh, that we've cut across the Bay of Biscay from La Rochelle. It's certainly 2,500, potentially even more. Of course, we're going to have to ensure that we keep enough fuel to get that back as well. The following evening, we've just been informed that our production research over at the headquarters for some new torpedoes, uh, some torpedo control program is complete, the so-called LUT program, and we've had an officer uh, helping with the research. This is going to allow us to use torpedoes and have additional programs for when, when we're within convoys and allows us to shoot from less than ideal angles and the torpedo will go off in all sorts of directions and so we look forward to make use of that of course before we can use those torpedoes we will need to return uh, to base to re-equip so that will be for a future mission it's the following morning an hour or so after sunrise and we've spotted three smokestacks we're currently right in the middle of the english channel halfway between the uk and france and i'm almost sure these are going to be three British destroyers and based on the smokestacks they could be heading our way and so with that said I think it's time to dive down. Snorkels goes up. Issue to dive the sub has been given. Just about to see the destroyers there on the horizon to the right. And finally, down she goes. Hopefully, she'll be able to uh, resume like that. If those destroyers get too much closer, we'll have to fold the snorkel down as well. Well, half an hour or so later, here's the situation. Uh, we have had to abandon our original course. It was taking us too close to these guys. Uh, currently picking them up on hydrophone. They're about five miles um, of uncertainty on a distance of approximately 10 kilometers. Sorry, five kilometers of uncertainty, about 10 kilometers away. And if we come over to the north, although we didn't see these guys, uh, there's yet further... Uh, propeller noises, an isolated ship, uh, which, you know, by extension, is likely to be either another sub or even a merchant ship. Usually you don't get the Navy boats going by themselves. Just two hours later, having cranked up to flank speed and reports of another boat, and what do you know, that is a British destroyer. Bell goes ringing and dinging, and so with that, it's time for an emergency dive. Down we go, crash dive. See you down there. Oh, a minute or two later, here we are on the seabed floor, creeping along the channel, not very deep at all. And uh, yeah, this will give us somewhere nice to hide out should we need to. A tactic we're definitely going to be needing to employ at the Scapa Flow. With the destroyer suddenly making a turn in our direction, we've had to drop right down to silent speed. We've rigged for ultra quiet 
And if we take a look on the map view, the destroyer now really close indeed. Um, less than three kilometers away. May even be prudent to come to a full stop and allow this destroyer to pass. So that's what we're going to do. Full stop. Here we see ourselves right above the seafloor. I think what I'm going to do is force myself to lay on the seafloor just to make sure that this guy doesn't in any way detect us. So full stop. Trying to increase depth just so we touch the seafloor. There we go. And we'll lay on the bed there until the threat has passed. Half an hour later, we return to surface, hearing the destroyer pass harmly over. Take a look on the scope. Crew see nothing, and it's time to surface in a further 10 minutes or so, and resume the patrol at flank speed. Good morning. We're now well away from the channel. It's the morning of the 6th of March, I believe, 42. And we're traversing up the eastern coast of the UK. We'll be in Sco Scottish waters. By the end of the day, crew discipline is starting to fall a little bit. This is in no small part because they've done several patrols now without a holiday. And I think to help alleviate this, we're going to offer some extra food and lay some music on. Music blaring, crew starting to feel better, but a lot of them are tired and that goes for the officers as well. Five out of seven asleep. And with the German anthem going, I think it's one of the few things we can get away with. If we come to the galley, we've got cheese, we've got bacon, we've got fresh veg. That will improve morale. If we take a look, there we see it. Discipline 91% and rising. Everybody's happy. We're continuing at high speed up the eastern coast. I'll bring you back with something else to report. And as we're starting to lose light, golden hour fading, we're now well inside Scottish waters several hours later. And we're only about three or four hundred kilometers from where we need to be. I think uh, it, we may be too far to pull this attack off tonight, but it's going to allow us all night to get there easily. We'll have a little look around, see what we can see. We'll come away. We'll have a rest during the day safely away. We'll make sure all the officers are rested. And then the following night, which will be tomorrow night, uh, we'll look to move in for the kill. It's half past eight the following morning, the 7th of March, and we've made it to our destination. See there, we're just uh, a few short kilometers away from where we need to be. Unfortunately, as you can see, it's well past daybreak. I was hoping to get here with some night still left. Alas, it's not to be. Um, that will help us uh, spot things out, but it'll also help the enemy spot us out. So we're going to have to be super careful. And with that, uh, we're going to double the watch up top. Men's will take two guys with you to make absolutely sure uh, we've got every conceivable advantage possible. We're also going to get our radio operator Schuster and get him onto the hydrophone. Of course, the hydrophone has the Metox attached to it. The Metox, again, being this, uh, if I can show it, not very well. <laughs> Apologies. This little cross. Then there's an auto save. <laughs> Everything against us today. This little cross here on top of the U-boat. If uh, let's see if can we. having a hard time taking a look but in any case this little cross here is a very rudimentary radar device known as the metox and it does work and uh, is going to give us warning of incoming aircraft slightly from further away than our crew topside can see however does require somebody to be on the hydrophone a trained user like schuster the better and ideally with an assistant as well although at this moment in time 
Yeah, we can just about spare one if we juggle the crew around. And so what we're going to do is get as close as we can and I'll bring you back if we see anything, which is surely just moments away. Well, I don't believe it. Just 20, 25 minutes later, we've been enveloped in a massive, what looks like snowstorm. Visibility is collapsed. It's snowing. The sky is overcast. It's dropped right down. We've elected to drop down to slow speed and we're going to dunk down to periscope depth. Let Schuster have a listen. We're going to see more from underneath the sea than we are on top with these conditions. We'll see if we can see where enemy ships may be operating. Well, our hydrophone guy, Schuster's had several minutes to listen and he reckons at least, a he you know, if we ignore behind us because we can't hear, that there are no ships in the area moving, which means these guys, however many there are in there, must all be tied up, moored up. Now, with the weather conditions being as bad as they are, no ships moving, I think I'm going to try and take the opportunity to get over this U-boat net. It's a lot easier to do at high tide. And then once we're over the net, safely on the other side, if need be, we can lay ourselves down let everybody have a rest and uh, we'll be ready uh, to fight when the night rolls around. Well, as we try and get over one of the nets here, you see visibility has dropped down to almost naught. We can barely see more than 100 yards or so. And this is incredibly dangerous. With the boat, enemy boats not moving, we've got no idea where they are by listening. Let's hope we can get over this net without any difficulty. We did collide with the net briefly, but only just. And so, thankfully, with it being high tide, it was more just a case of scraping against it rather than it uh, preventing our ability to get through. We're well inside the Royal Navy base now, and due to the horrific visibility, we're having to creep forward at uh, silent speed. And there, what looks like potentially an enemy vessel, uh, maybe not. Perhaps I'm just seeing shadows. I think I'm seeing shadows. And if we take a look here on map view, here we are, we're inside the base. Uh, we got about, they reckon this was where the battleship was last seen, about 10 kilometers to go. But we'll see how close we can get. And certainly it would be a benefit to us. Visibility increasing, we can dive down and rely on our periscope. I think it will be safer, actually, if, if we already go down to periscope depth and just keep the snorkel above. And so that's what we'll do. Uh, we'll turn the gyro off and I'll bring you back. Just give you an idea of how shallow this area is. There we are. And we're at periscope depth. And if you take a look, the sea floor's here. So we've got maybe, maybe three, three, five, three or five feet, something like that. Certainly, I don't think we'd be able to stand in that area. If you take a look at the size of the U boat, it's much larger than the size beneath its keel. Snorkels up. So far, nothing to report. Ten minutes later, I've made the decision to switch over to electrics. At least for now, we're going to keep the snorkel extended. Menzel's on the periscope. We have heard one little group of ships a long distance away seems to be patrolling over on the southern side of the harbour, heading south. And so at least for now, not a concern. Enemy aircraft was spotting overhead. We didn't see them until they're right on top of us, but thankfully, with visibility being as poor as it is, they had no chance of seeing our tiny little periscope, despite the fact our snorkel's been raised. We could radio it off, but we're certainly not going to send off a radio transmission right in the middle of the Royal Navy's largest base, uh, surrounded with 51 ships. And as we edge towards 12 o'clock noon... On the 7th of March 41, we've just got five kilometers to go. We've been creeping around down here. 
objective is to try and remain undetected so that's what we're trying to do unfortunately with the visibility again we've got no idea how far the nearest ship is and with all of them with their engines cut you know our hydrophone is useless the only thing we can really make good use of the hydrophone on is if we spook the ships and they start moving we'll really know about it at this point, I'm almost concerned that my officers are going to get far too tired before anything happens. So maybe we'll increase speed to slow. We'll certainly give some of these guys a cup of coffee. So let's come in. Menzel's in desperate need of warm. There you go. Hoffman needs one. And that's replenished them a bit, of course. At the end of the day, they're going to need sleep regardless. But those are the two most tired officers, it would seem. Puts Hoffman on the scope. Menzel. Well, I'll tell you what, you can go on the radio. This guy, well, he's performing the maintenance. Michael Knurd, I think, will put him on depth keeping. We'll put this guy... Where is he? On the radio. There we go. And the captain. Alarm is not enabled. Well, I think it's time to enable the alarm. And we'll put Captain on the command station. That's only available to us with the alarm on. And we're going to continue on moving in. We know we're surrounded with enemies. And we're going to rig for ultra quiet as well, despite the poor visibility. Well, it's finally happened. At a few minutes past 12, we've run into an enemy destroyer. The... Uh, H-94, it would seem like, not the one that we're after. Um, so we've come to a full stop. We're going to have to silently reverse. And then look to... Uh, see if we can come down this way, I think. So here we are, five minutes later. That's how long it's taken us to manoeuvre on silent speed. And uh, we're coming around his behind. Hopefully that's enough that he can't hear us. We have to keep our periscope up because we can't hear any of the other ships. And we certainly don't want to pass right underneath them as silent speed or not. Well, we are finally past him, but it's taken us literally half an hour to move less than one kilometre due to the... Uh, very slow pace and the fact we had to double back a bit come all the way around and just to mark his position the enemy ship is right around there and so we're now we're continuing on to the last known position of the hms royal oak well here we are we're exactly where we were supposed to be and unfortunately due to the poor visibility we can't see anything yes we've got an unknown warship but, uh, you know, what's that? Certainly not what we came for. The crew are exhausted. I don't know what to do. I think I'm going to stop. We'll lay on the floor. I'll turn the alarm off. We'll try and get some rest. And hopefully when we come up in a bit, visibility will be somewhat better here. Uh, it's currently four minutes to one on the 7th of March, 1941. That's the plan. Crew very much on edge. Not sure how well they're going to sleep right in the middle of the lion's den. We'll just have to see. Well, here we are on the sea floor, And we've tried to send our officers as many as we can to bed, including the captain. But Schuster's going to stay awake at least for now on Hydro Farm. We've got Knud on death keeping. And that's simply because we don't have enough beds for them all. But we were going to come up for some air. And what do you know? Massive disturbance and suddenly all of the Royal Navy ships spring to life, including the guy. I think this was the one that we avoided. Not seen anything big. But these guys are going to start looking for us and start pinging. Our only choice lay on the seafloor. Again. 
I really thought we were going to be able to come up. Hopefully they just heard something somewhere and they don't really know where to look. If they start pinging and we're on the seafloor, it should make us hard to find. At least we're in a relatively deep portion of as far as this particular base goes. So they should be able to pass over top of us without uh, colliding. Let's just hope they don't get creative with the depth charge patterns. Well, here we see it. And if I just uh, make one second equal 12 temporarily, we can get a little idea of where these guys are going on patrol. They're uncomfortably close. And they're depth charging, so I'm going to stop making things fast. Let's switch to blue light and let's close the bulkheads. At least we're, we can't sink any further. The problem is, if we do take a leak... Everybody up, unfortunately. If more depth charges, stand by. Down they come. Some of the flashes are due to the storm. Some of them are due to the jet charges. Not very nice. Anymore. And there's the creepy thing. They suddenly stop the engine, cut it out, and have a real good listen. And then they start up again. I don't think you're going to hear anything because we're being as quiet as we can. But our officers are getting increasingly tired despite the coffee. At some point, if we don't run into the battleship soon, we're going to have to exit so they can have a proper rest and come back. Well, it's been five minutes since we've been depth charged, but as we can see, the ships are continuing to move and patrol. Um, the weather's still bad. We can see flashes. Um, yeah. So all that we've done is cause all of the ships to be repositioned. And that's going to make our attack even harder. So we were unable to sneak in, unfortunately. Um, kind of regret trying to come in with the weather being as bad as it was. I think that was a huge mistake. It's uh, 20 past 2 in the afternoon. Things have been quiet for a while. But our crew are getting increasingly tired and stressed. I've made the decision to exit the scapper flow. And we'll try and come back when conditions are a little clearer. If we take a look on the map view, we have used the time to continue hunting. If you recall, uh, we were being attacked right around this green dot. And so we're a few miles away. But uh, yeah, it's time to try and escape and hope that our officers can catch some shut eye before it's too late. I'll bring you back. I don't believe here. <laughs> We were just about to cancel. Well, I was. I was on the way to escape and we've ran into the Royal Oak by pure accident. Well, there's no doubt about it. We're coming in to take the shot. We're going to switch to silent running. I'm going to make sure I maintain visual with this guy. Come a little closer and then we'll try and position ourselves there. It'll be about nine, eight, nine hundred yard shot right onto her broadside. I'll bring you back once we're ready into the firing position. Well, here we are, the HMS Royal Oak. I'm just about make her out. There's a flag about huge guns. This attack, again, as we said, was really carried out about 1 a.m. But with our crew tired and it took us this long to find it, it feels like we won the lottery. 
that we even ran into her on our escape. We'll put that into the TDC battleship. It's the first battleship that we'll have sunk. Battleship, and it is a Nelson class. Yes, velocity. Well, we don't even need to measure. It's zero. She's parked up. Of course, well, angle on bow is on the 90. And the distance, well, waterline up to the highest mast. Oh, it's taken such a long time to split. She's so tall. I've just got my mast more or less where the mouse is, uh, where the mast is because it's hard to see. It's right around there. They reckon about 690 meters. That'll do for me. Let's line up amidships. She's, uh, about there and we're gonna fire all four one two a depth of two meters and i'm gonna spread it by 30 tube three no nothing special on the speed just standard and tube four uh, double to the right should it miss uh, after 800 meters almost for sure we're going to hit something else Los. Los tubes then one through four are all being discharged and with that let's get rid of 30 seconds. I reckon 30 seconds. 20 seconds. 20 seconds. Ten seconds bis Einschlag. Tension running high. Jawohl. Treffer. Yes, there we go. There's number two. Treffer. There's number three. Treffer. Bang. Four shots, four hits. And look at the health evaporate. The Royal Oak is going down. She's listing. She's taking water. I'll turn that effect off. Forgive me. But yeah, that's how it went. Uh, she listed over to one side and then what apparently happened was as, as she was keeling over none of the crew had any of the hatches closed because they just weren't expecting there to be any danger despite because they were at the home port right and so the water as it came in had nothing stopping it so that made her sink quicker and then the secondly as she began listing i believe to her starboard side the huge guns the huge deck guns for whatever reason didn't stay centered there we go the huge deck guns then swung around to one side and because these these guns swung around that just assisted the ship in tipping over and sinking even quicker and so there we go the sinking of the hms royal oak let's see if we can escape first order of business i think is to lay down because these boats are on patrol not the best of time to try and escape and I've picked a terrible spot to dive down and lay on the sea. If we look, there's almost no distance. If <laughs> We're almost at periscope depth. And so I'm going to have to tell my guy to lower the scope. If a boat comes over there, I think they're going to ram us. So it's a potluck, really, that a boat either rams us or it doesn't, I think. Well, at least for now, they haven't spotted us. We've heard them go by. And with these boats currently 1.7 and the other near one that we hear about 1.9 behind, the Royal Oak or what was the Royal Oak is our 2R12. We've got numerous other contacts down here. Um, I'm going to try and sneak off in this direction and the plan ultimately um, head on like that. But at least for now, let's try and get the first part of this plan done. I've come back up to periscope depth. Uh, we'll give an assist on Hoffman to help load these tubes a bit quicker. And the other <laughs> the other Hoffman who's on periscope. Up scope. And with that, uh, we're going to make our way. Um, let's go slow speed. 
and I'll bring you back with any updates. So let's see if we can get out. Again, our officer's getting very tired indeed. Ten minutes later, we've managed to get past the stricken Royal Oak, who was uh, laying on the floor. <laughs> the top half of us stuck out. That's how shallow the water is. Uh, these destroyers here still on patrol, uh, but they're currently around three kilometers away. So, so far, I think we've been really lucky. About half an hour later, we're continuing to escape. Still stormy, but visibility conditions are beginning to improve. We're still well inside the base, but the ships have stopped patrolling. Um, no guarantees, there's nobody ahead of us, but we're hoping they're not. And so we're going to play it safe. Officers and crew are starting to complain about being tired. We're just going to have to keep on duty a little longer, I'm afraid. Half an hour later, and despite still snowing, visibility conditions have cleared dramatically. We've stuck up the scope all the way, and here we can see some of the islands that uh, form the natural harbour base to the Scapa flow. As we rotate the scope... There seem to be no ships in the area. And at this point, I'm thinking... That's just a rock and some trees. At this point, I'm thinking to surface the boat and get out of here at flank speed. Up she comes, then. Crew just starting to climb up the onto the bridge. And uh, time to start up the diesels. Destroyer was sighted around 4 o'clock, uh, nearer to our 5160 on the bearing. Um, I think we're far away, he can't see us. In fact, uh, we're, we're probably below his horizon. But I think with the visibility and being almost, if not entirely below his horizon, he won't be able to see us. So we're coming up to the nets. Moment of truth. We'll hope we'll get uh, through them. And there we go. We've collided. Looks like it was just a minor scrape. Doesn't look like it stopped us from getting through. Sometimes they'll completely tangle you up. And you've got to wait for high tide or something. But for now, let's message all of these queued messages. Including the all important sinking of the battleship. And we can see that's going to give us a huge value there. 21,441. And the reason why the funny number... Um, some of the earlier reports that we didn't radio off immediately have begun to deteriorate in value because, of course, the the older the report is, the less uh, value it is. And that's due to things like spotting the uh, early destroyers and so on. So, yeah, looks like we're over the net and uh, in a minute we'll turn the alarm off. But for now, we'll continue flank speed. Well, as the islands disappear behind us and we sail back off into the middle of the North Sea, I think it's time to turn the alarm off. We've already turned the gyros back on the compressors. We've restored light into norm. And at this time, we'll disable the alarm. We've opened the bulkheads as well. And with that, <laughs> look at them all collapsing into bed. Now I'll bring you back. Well, I was hoping that was it, but it looks like we've ran into a destroyer on our escape. Correction 2. And I'm thinking we can pick these guys off. We'll dunk down, we'll wait for them to pass, and uh, we'll take a shot. And so I think a very hard turn to the left. Down we go. And I'll bring you back. Well, these are what appear to be tiny coastal patrol boats. And I don't think we can hit these with our torpedoes. We've got numerous crew exhausted that are not waking up despite the alarm. The only way we could really go after these would be topside. But with so many crew exhausted, unable to get out of bed despite the alarm. It just means if we took on any damage, we'd be unable to deal with. So unfortunately, while it would have been fun to tangle with these guys topside... I just don't think it's worth the risk. Well, here we are three days later. March the 10th, 1941, arriving back into the port of La Rochelle. 
No doubt to a hero's welcome. And uh, we'll deal with the awards. Uh, Rudolf Menzel on his way to the Knight's Cross with the Oak Leaves. And it looks like Kurt Hoffman has received a Knight's Cross with Oak Leaves and is uh, starting to get towards his uh, with the crossed swords. Um, who else? Well, it's Klaus, the captain, and he's on his way towards the Knight's Cross with oak leaves, crossed swords, and diamonds. In fact, he's about 80% of the way there. And so here we see it. We have successfully completed the attack of the Scapa Flow, which is going to give us 200, uh, sorry, two points, uh, two reputation points, 8,000 Reichmarks, and it's going to acquire us with a new skill, uh, the Bull's Eye. Uh, which go for all of our leader officers that were on board. So I hope very much that you enjoyed the episode. It's our crew is going to go away on a much needed break. And uh, until next time, wherever in the world you may be, take care. I'll see you soon. And I've got more exciting stuff lined for the channel, including an interview with Germany's highest scoring U-boat ace ever. Until then, take care. Bye-bye.